episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. And we are live. Welcome to a special live edition of STS. We are covering the Charlie Adelson trial and a verdict has been reached. I repeat, a verdict has been reached in the Charlie Adelson trial, and it will be read in probably about 30 minutes time. Carl Steinbeck, who is set to be on this show, is headed back into the courtroom as they await the <laughs> yes. reading. <laughs> as they await the reading of the verdict as is katie cool lady who is also set to join us but if you are just tuning in from around the world around the globe around the universe a verdict has been reached in the charlie adelson trial two amazing experts here one who specializes in criminal defense. That would be Tim Jansen, the famed Tallahassee defense attorney. And the other is Richard Gabriel. Richard is a world-renowned jury consultant out of Los Angeles and has handled some of the biggest cases uh, that you have all heard of. Richard Gabriel with immense experience in how juries operate and think. Tim Jansen, to you first, being from Tallahassee, the hometown boy, uh, what does it say to you that three hours – after they left for lunch, roughly three hours, and then they had to have lunch. So two hours in, they've got yeah. a verdict. Uh, it sounds like it's a prosecution verdict. I would not think that you're going to get 12 people to agree on an acquittal on all of these charges within that time frame. I, I just don't see it. Uh, Richard Gabriel got asked you the same exact question. By the way, uh, we are looking at a live shot of the Leon County Courthouse in Tallahassee, Florida, where we are awaiting a verdict in the Charlie Adelson trial. A uh, verdict is expected to be handed down, and uh, we will soon know the fate of Charlie Adelson. Richard Gabriel, uh, again, they broke for lunch at around 2 p.m. Eastern. It is now 5 p.m. here. You have to assume they took a one-hour lunch break and began deliberating roughly two hours ago. Uh, what does it tell you? Well, there's a couple of ways to think about this. I, I intend to agree with Tim on this uh, because there's obviously a lot of charges. It's hard to acquit on all those. Um, that being said, you know, when we when we were working on the O.J. Simpson case, those jurors came back rather quickly mm -hmm. with their verdict within two or three hours in, in that very massive case. But that being said, there's really two ways that juries tend to uh, deliberate. One has to do with verdict driven, which is literally a four person will go around the table and just go through the verdict form and ask how many yeses, how many noes. And if there's yeses on a lot of the verdict questions, jury can get done with a, with a, uh, a verdict really quickly on that. Um, but that being said, and then if there's noes, obviously they talk about it. But sometimes there also is what they call an evidence driven. Four person oh. allows everybody to, yeah. to move through the, the all the, up it looks like right. we're back and forth. Uh, yeah, it looks like we've got uh, Judge Everett in the courtroom. Let's listen in and then we'll pick up the conversation. It's going to be a little while, but let's listen in for a moment. All right. For everyone in the gallery, uh, once the verdict is read, if there can please be no expressions either of shock or anger, please have no reaction at all. We're going to thank the jury for their service and then they'll be dismissed. But again, it's very important not to either praise them or uh, be negative concerning whatever the outcome of this is going to be. If you don't think you can control yourself, please step outside now. Jack so Campbell is in the courtroom. <clears throat> yeah, Jack Campbell's in the courtroom. You saw Jack Campbell, okay. He's um, Yeah, he's in the back talking to the bailiff right now. Let me ask you this. Obviously, Rashbaum's got uh, enough experience to know that this is probably not a great sign, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, I can tell you, Richard, that uh, I was in the court all last week, and about half the jurors are women, and a majority of those so women like are— the, Is the jury going to be coming right back in now? Yeah. Okay. Oh, is it that quick? 
Tim, yeah, it looks like they're waiting right now. So so they, can't, they can't do it till the defendant gets in there. Till the defendant gets in. Okay, so we are uh, we're waiting mm -hmm. on the defendant. But uh, I have to tell you, and I I'm, I apologize because uh, you're getting your. If I bring a comment up, we're cutting your face off. So I'm going to leave the comments down for right now. But I was in that courtroom, Richard, and um, I'm the son of a psych psychiatrist and a son of a social worker, but I'm not as uh, um, you know a psychologist myself. But looking at their faces, they did not appear to be enamored with Charlie Adelson in any way. Never made eye contact with him. There was one questionable juror who's making some. They are the Markells, by the way. That's Phil Markell talking to his wife, Ruth Markell. I think those are some probably some friends of theirs, is my guess, uh, behind them because they've been talking to them all day. But, Richard, what kind of sign is it when a juror is literally not making eye contact? They, they almost look they were, like they were shooting daggers his way, most of this testimony. Well, nonverbal language is very difficult to interpret in the courtroom. And since jurors know that they're being viewed and and being scrutinized every single little piece of behavior, they tend to try to be pretty stone-faced in all these high-profile trials. So I try to be careful about interpreting it. When we take a look at juror behavior, we look at a couple things. Is there a difference between how they are looking at the defense versus how they're looking at the prosecution? Uh, is there a difference between how they're looking at some of the defense witnesses versus the prosecution witnesses? Um, and if there's differences, then you can tend to do that with that. But sometimes, you know, it can be really misleading. There's some jurors that can nod and and uh, look like they're in great agreement and they're just thinking, no, I think this is a bunch of BS. And so it's it's you have to be a little careful when you're interpreting the behavior. Mm. You know, I'm looking at the comments and I don't want to sound holier than now in any way at all. But at the end of the day, there's no winners at all, um, really. I mean, I know the Markells are still going to be suffering and uh, Charlie's life, if... He knows. He, looked, he knows. Yeah. If convicted, he's, his life is effectively over. Um, Let me tell you this. Uh, somehow, some way, prosecution through bailiffs, they already know the verdict, okay? They got a bailiff sitting out that courtroom. They can hear it and... Look at his face. He's looking pretty confident. Look and, at his face. He's saying he's saying something to himself right there. Keep going, Tim. Uh, they know. I can tell you they know when I go in the courtroom, especially federal court, somehow bailiffs. I don't know how they do it, should they do it, but I can always tell how giddy they look um, that they know. And juror, they, they have a bailiff sitting outside the out of the jury room, right? And they can hear what's going on, and they can see. So um, I'd be shocked if it was not a – and I think Daniel knows. I think Daniel told him and. Um, wow. I mean, just look at this face for a moment. Um, what I was saying before is, you know, the instinct I think is to celebrate and you want to celebrate jury getting justice, but, but this is effect. The jury's coming in now. I think this is effectively the end Everyone of, else, of, please rise. of Charlie's <laughs> life and Dan Markell's life was taken in 2014. He's not rising now. Yeah, how come he's not getting up, Tim? Because he's pissed off. Probably mm -hmm. knows. One, but the four person can be seated. See, he didn't even stand for the jury. Yeah. Has the jury reached a unanimous verdict? Here we go. If you please could hand the verdict form to the bailiff. The moment of truth. Let's be silent and hear this through. The verdict form is in its proper order. Madam Clerk, please publish the verdict. In the circuit court, a decision of the second judicial circuit in and for Leon County, Florida, the state of Florida versus Charles Adelson, case number 2016, CF 3036B, verdict. Count one. We, the jury, find as follows as to count one of the indictment, first degree murder, the defendant is guilty of first-degree murder. Count two. We, the jury, find as follows as to count two of the indictment, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. The defendant is guilty of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. Count three. We, the jury, find as follows as to count three of the indictment, 
solicitation to commit first degree murder, the defendant is guilty of solicitation to commit first degree murder. So say we all the sixth day of November, 2023. Does the defense wish for the court to poll the jurors? Yes, Your Honor. Juror Moore, was your verdict and the verdict of the jury as a whole just announced? Yes. Juror Brazos, was your verdict and the verdict of the jury as a whole just announced? It was. Juror Gardner, was your verdict and the verdict of the jury as a whole just announced? Yes. Juror Strong, was your verdict and the verdict of the jury as a whole just announced? Yes, sir. Juror Kraft, was your verdict and the verdict of the jury as a whole just announced? Yes, Your Honor. Juror Milne, was your verdict and the verdict of the jury as a whole just announced? Yes, sir. Juror Hawley, was your verdict and the verdict of the jury as a whole just announced? Yes, sir. Juror Thorne, was your verdict and the verdict of the jury as a whole just announced? Yes, sir. Juror Brim, was your verdict and the verdict of the jury as a whole just announced? Yes, sir. Juror Williams, was your verdict and the verdict of the jury as a whole just announced? Yes, sir. Juror Douglas, was your verdict and the verdict of the jury as a whole just announced? Yes, Your Honor. Juror Platt, was your verdict and the verdict of the jury as a whole just announced? Yes, Your Honor. Members of the jury, I'm going to give you one last brief instruction, and from here, you will be discharged from your service. On behalf of the parties, the lawyers, and the people of the state of Florida, I want to thank you for your time and consideration of this case. I'm also going to advise you of some special privileges that are enjoyed by jurors. No juror can be required to talk about the discussions that occurred in the jury room, except by court order. For many centuries, our society has relied upon juries for consideration of difficult cases. We have recognized for hundreds of years that a jury's deliberations, discussions, and votes should remain a private affair for as long as they wish it. Therefore, the law gives you a unique privilege not to speak about the jury's work. The lawyers and their representatives are not permitted to initiate any communication with you concerning the trial. However, you may speak to the lawyers or anyone else about the trial if you desire. You also have the right to refuse to speak with anyone. A request may come from those who are simply curious or from those who might seek to find fault with this decision. It will be up to you to decide whether to preserve your privacy as a juror. We give you our sincere thanks for the work that you have performed over this two week trial. You are discharged, have a wonderful evening. Yeah, his life is pretty much over. Everyone may be seated. Mr. Adelson, you are going to be remanded pending sentencing at this time. Does the defense wish to have a pre-sentence investigation report prepared as to counts two and three? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. The court will order that the pre-sentence investigation be prepared by the Department of Corrections believe it will take possibly a month i'm not yep. sure if it will take longer than that from there will the parties be prepared to move into sentencing yes your honor may i have a moment to confer with the family if they wish to make any impact statements tonight yes, sir. go ahead yeah they have a right to make an impact statement to the judge and instead of having them travel back from canada let them do it right there since they're already here um the other two counts are not minimum mandatory life. So that's why he's entitled to a pre-sentence report. It's really moot because he's going to get mandatory life on count one. I don't know why the defense asked for it, um, but he did. And, and Tim, is this going to be LWAP life without parole? Yes. Life is life in Florida. Tracy, he never gets out. 
never gets out, never sees the light of day. Uh, I can guarantee you, um, you know, he was speaking to himself that that was not remorse for the murder of Dan Markell, but rather feeling sorry for himself. And finally, his arrogance and hubris has caught up with him. This is um, was the moment of truth for Charlie Adelson. And uh, here comes Georgia. I, I, an impact tonight, um, but as you know, the family members have traveled a great distance, so we're hoping Your Honor will permit them to appear and make those statements by Zoom whenever we're reconvening for Senate. That will be permitted. Anyone who wishes to provide testimony for the sentencing portion may do so over Zoom. I believe this does not implicate any right of confrontation unless the defense has something to raise concerning that matter. No, Your Honor. Very well. We are in recess at this point. Oh, yes. We are going to wait until uh, the jury's gone. Jurors have vacated the courthouse, and from there, everyone will be dismissed. He didn't adjudge him guilty. He should have said, I adjudge you guilty of all three. So he should do it now, but he didn't. The state should ask. But um, Is that just a technicality? Well, he, then he's a convicted murderer. When a judge goes, I, I hereby accept the verdicts, and I adjudicate you guilty now. Um, George is relieved. Um, I'm What's sure they think. Uh, go ahead. What's Daniel telling Charlie right now? What do you tell your client right now? Date. We'll file an appeal. Status. This will ensure that we have the PSI in place. That will be on December 12th at 2.30 in the afternoon. If everything is prepared, we can go ahead and have the final disposition on that day as well. Yes, Your Honor. I would think that gives them a lot of confidence to go after Donna. Yeah, I want to talk to you about that. I was saying before, Charlie's talking to himself. Uh, this is the first time he's really been caught. Um, he was speeding, getting away with speeding tickets, getting away with selling steroids. Mm -hmm. Who knows what else? And finally, the long arm of the law, and that's why they call it the long arm of the law, has caught up with him. And I can guarantee you, this is not remorse or feeling sorry for Dan Markell. This is feeling sorry for Charlie Adelson. And, you know, there are consequences. And now Charlie Adelson is seeing that firsthand. It's not a fun moment, though. It's a very uncomfortable moment. Dan Markell's life was taken. Charlie Adelson's life is effectively taken. What do you tell Ben and Lincoln? What do you tell the children? Um they're going to find out about this one day that their uncle paid someone to murder their own father. And they're going to have to reconcile that. Here comes Georgia. Let's listen to the end. She put a lot of hard work into this case. I was just going to ask you, Tim, is this the biggest winner for a career? Uh, it's got to be one of the top big ones, I would think. Mm. Yeah, I would think this might be the biggest one for Georgia. Richard, what's it like in there, these moments? You know, uh, it's, you know, people want to be happy for the conviction, and there's every reason to be happy for that conviction, but it is kind of a bittersweet moment because, like I said, his life is ruined. Dan Markell's life was taken. These kids now have to one day figure this out. Likely th their grandmother is going to be taken uh, away and indicted for this. What is the feeling like in that courtroom? Well, as you as you described, it's a mixed feeling. I mean, the, the, the truth is most of the viewers there are going to be hugely gratified, going to be really satisfied with the verdict. Uh, you know, obviously who are anticipating a guilty verdict. The people who are close to both of them uh, suffer. It, it's, it's a really a bittersweet time for them because on one hand, the they've been focused so much on just the trial and the evidence and wanting an outcome. And sometimes the gravity of what has happened 
to the family member. And sometimes some, they don't even let themselves grieve as much until they get that verdict. And then sometimes it really does hit them afterwards. So it's it's a really mixed feeling for the families that are there. And obviously, you know, obviously Charlie Adelson's parents and his 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 people are, are incredibly sad uh, about this, too. But it's it's a tragedy all all around. Uh, Tim, you heard that Georgia went up there talking about a victim impact statement. The Markells are not ready to give it. Obviously, they're down here from Canada. They spend part of their winters in in the States. Uh, the judge told them it would Have be a good okay. night, everyone. Standing for Judge Everett. Not a good night for um, Daniel Rosbaum. No, and there you see Charlie being led away, remanded into state custody. Tim, I want to ask you about the last time you'll see him in a suit. At sentencing, he'll be in prison garb. How, how soon will sentencing be? Probably 45, 30, 40 days for this pre-sentence report. He'll get life on count one, and he'll get plus 30 and 30 on the other counts, probably. You know, Charlie allegedly made a joke to the bailiffs watching him that they were going to have to drive him back to South Florida after the trial. And I don't think those jokes are being made anymore. There's Carl mm -hmm. Steinbeck, all six foot four of him. And Jack um, Campbell, he shook Jack Campbell's hand. Yeah. yeah, look at that. There you go. They're, they're filing out of the courtroom. Carl Steinbeck, he played a. Uh, competitive football and just patting everyone on the back as they leave there. His hubris caught up with him. You know, he, he's going to be sent to state prison. Tim Jansen, how does that work now? He's obviously been held in the County jail. What do they do with Charlie Adelson at this point? He, once he gets sentenced, he'll be going to a North Florida reception center. They'll do medical, mental health. Uh, and then they're going to, um, they'll place him somewhere violent criminal life sentence he's not going to go to a good place very violent place probably and uh, he's probably not going to do well so he's going to be in the leon county jail now until sentencing is that right yes, that's correct and then a couple of weeks after that they'll transport him to the north florida reception center so tonight he'll be at least in a familiar cell that's where he's been staying and then uh during after sentencing he'll be sent uh, right. he'll be the way Richard Gabriel, it was two hours basically of deliberations. What does that tell you? Do you think that this jury made up their mind? You know, this is into the second or third week now. Um, you think the jury made up their mind long ago about what they were going to decide? For the most part, jurors by closing arguments, especially in a big trial like this, already know how they feel about it. The big question is really how much in agreement because they can't talk to each other prior to the verdict or prior to deliberations. So for the most part, they, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about closing arguments and there's a lot of time recounting evidence. And a lot of times jurors really don't even need that. What you're trying to do in closing arguments is really give each of, especially you, what you could, would call your opinion leaders, the strongest jurors on there, um, the arguments to support convincing the other jurors there about what their position is. So for the most part, I think most of these jurors really did have a sense of what it is. And I think what they ended up doing is they probably just went around on each of the verdicts and, and said, okay, are we in agreement on this? And I think they found out pretty quickly they were in agreement. I don't think they wanted to come back too soon. I think they wanted to you know make sure that they had a conscientious verdict. They may have discussed one or two pieces here and there, you know, you know, asking about, okay, what do you, what do you think about the extortion, you know, things like that. And then they would obviously did, they dismiss that. They found that was not true. And and saying they may have discussed motive a little bit. They may have discussed a couple of the witnesses and, and, you know, some of those, some of those elements, but for the most part, obviously these jurors were in pretty significant agreement. I mean, they could have actually come to a decision very quickly and then basically hung around for a while because they didn't want to come back too soon. Uh, Twyla Olson, more justice for the Markell family. Three to go. Prayers for the family. Tim Jansen, Steve Cohen just texted me and said it took longer for them 
uh, in deliberations to convict Fredo Garcia. He is a purported <laughs> trigger man. <laughs> That's not a good sign. What does that tell you? And the defense was horrible. It had no credibility. Uh, what we were hearing uh, in Peter was in in the in the closing arguments, the jurors weren't even looking at the at the defense lawyer. They were taking notes during the prosecution, and they turned away from him and were walk, cleaning their glasses. Um, he went on and on for several hours um, and asked them to take this long leap that was defied logic and common sense, and <laughs> it was just a poor plan and as a poor execution. <clears throat> You know, there's a there's one comment that the defense lawyer made that I think it obviously came back to bite him. You know, he said, I hate it when a murderer comes into the courtroom and lies. Yes. Well, Charlie took the stand there. And so I think that was a poor choice of words on the defense lawyer's part. We, I, I actually caught that, Richard. I'm glad you bring that up earlier today. And uh, court is effectively closed for the day. Uh, Judge Stephen Everett, by the way, did an amazing job. He kept the court, it, the room, the courtroom in line, moved it along. Tim, I think uh, kudos go out to Judge Everett. He can finally enjoy his red velvet cake now, can he? For sure, for sure. He, uh, that, I think that's one of the highest, biggest high pro, high trials that Judge Everett has done. He did it fabulous. He didn't try to steal the show like Judge Ito. He maintained control of his courtroom and he did it on a timely manner, kept it rolling. And he was fair. I think he was fair to both parties. And I, I think it's going to be upheld on appeal. How soon is there an appeal, Tim? How long does that take? You got to have sentencing first. Then you got to file the notice of appeal. Then the transcript's got to be sent over to the first DCA. I mean, it, it could take a year, year and a half, two years before they come back with anything. I'm sure then he'll try to go to um, the Supreme Court, uh, but but I don't see anything there. There wasn't any piece of evidence that was really questionable. There was no 404B. There was really no objection to the jury instructions that I'm aware of. Uh, he testified, which means credibility. Uh, sufficiency of the evidence would not, because credibility alone is sufficient to convict someone. So I don't see any glaring appellate issues. Um, so. I think he's going to be spending a long time in jail. And I think Donna, I think this gives the state a lot of confidence that they had this case. The jury came back in less than two hours that they might feel they have enough to go against Donna. And, and Tim, you know, Georgia uh, and you know, the office who makes that decision. Is it Mr. Campbell ultimately? And do you think Georgia wants to go after Donna? I think it'll be with Georgia and Jack sitting together. Jack will probably make the final call. He'll certainly take Georgia's position um, because she'd probably be the one trying it. He, she knows the facts better. Um, but I think ultimately be George Jack's final decision. Uh, Rich, I just want to get back to what you were saying because I kind of cut it off. But this issue of uh, he had this line where he said he, Daniel Rashbaum, said, I hate when murders lie in court. And he was speaking about the, his own defense theory and Katie Magbanawa. Uh, we now know that Charlie Adelson is a convicted mastermind of this. It can now uh, a convicted killer. How how critical of a mistake was that in terms of putting a pearl inside the ears of the jurors? Well, you, you know, you always have to be careful what you say, because, you know, I, I think every lawyer, whether they be a prosecutor or a defense lawyer, has to think about how is what I'm going to say going to be turned against me in this case. And you have to be, you know, like even just some of his does it make sense right. arguments. That by itself is a very challenging thing to do because, you know, you know, it's easy for a jury to come back and go, yeah, a lot of this makes sense here. So when you're picking themes and when you're picking what the words are that you're going to say, you have to have great care in sort of what you're going to be anchoring because it's so easy, especially even on rebuttal, for the prosecutor to come back and, and nail you with it and even for the jurors in deliberation to do the same thing. And Richard, um, Tim even pointed this out, and I didn't catch it, but at one point during his closing arguments, Daniel Rashbaum 
slipped up, had a faux pas and talked about how Charlie, his own defendant, had spent over a year in jail, basically handing the jurors the knowledge that he was <laughs> imprisoned. That's another big mistake. Do you see that being um, an appellate issue? At some no, right. I don't hear him, though. Do you, do you see that being an appellate issue? That's 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 probably a question for Tim. I, yeah. I think again, it, but it's a it's a weight of the evidence thing. And on, on appeals, from my general understanding, you have to have so much to show that it's so unduly prejudicial that the trial would have moved a different way if that that had done it. But I so I doubt it. But Tim's the expert on this, so I defer to him. Yeah. But you know, Richard, they take great pains not to show a defendant in custody, so they always get him dressed. They put him in there before the jury. And his own lawyer says he's been in custody for a year and a half, which infers, oh, he must be dangerous because he can't make bond. He must be really bad. That's the inference they don't on. And he gave it to him. Yeah. These are all little pieces. I mean, it's not I, I don't overturn it for sure. No, it's not going to overturn. I mean, the truth is that jurors understand a little bit of just how they feel in general about the case. I think the evidence probably was enough. But all these things sort of give comfort. In other words, jurors who may have you know, that sort of this gnawing belief, I've got this one outstanding issue that I may have some questions about or may have a little bit of doubt about. When you start piling these little things up, these little statements by the attorney or these little other things that knowledge there, it gives comfort to the jurors in their own decisions. Does it necessarily completely move the verdict one way or the other? It can in certain instances. In this case, I don't think so. I just want to take a quick moment while we have everyone here uh, to thank Tim Jansen again for all the work he's done. Thank the COE for all the work she's done behind the scenes. Space Coast out in Los Angeles near Richard Gabriel doing all the technical work behind the scenes. And of course, Steve Cohen, who's already working to get us a few jurors, which we were hoping to bring to you in the next you know, coming days to see what they were thinking, what was going on inside their minds as this uh, testimony was playing out. So huge thanks to all of them. And uh, if you could do us the very small favor of hitting that like button, it goes a long way. Uh, if you ever listen to us on audio podcasts, if you get, could give us five stars there, thank you so much. We'd appreciate it. The audio portion of what we do is very important for us. And if you do listen to us on Apple or Spotify or any of the audio podcasts, and you can give us a five-star review. We would greatly appreciate it. Without further ado, uh, Carl Steinbeck is in the house. Carl, what was the mood like? Uh, first of all, where were you when they said that they would be uh, reading the verdict? Where were you? Were you in the courthouse still? Yes, yes. I was uh, just right across the hall and down a little ways, right outside of where the uh, Markels are, uh, been uh, provided a room to uh wait during uh, these deliberations and whatnot. So um, got a little private room here set up with the help of some uh, personnel here. And um, it was it was quite, quite surreal to be here through this whole thing. And there was no eruption like you might think. I thought everybody handled themselves very professional. It was more like relief because I think it was so overwhelming evidence against him. It wasn't like a shocker, right? Everybody thought this is the expected outcome. There's no surprise. It just finally an Adelson went down. In fact, one I saw one of the porters asking Markel that when I was coming out of the courtroom to finally, what does it feel like to finally get the, you've had all these other convictions and now what does it feel like to get the first Markel? And they implied more to follow, right? But they didn't, um, the Markels just said, basically we're just focusing on this one right here tonight. We're just so very happy, happy and grateful for everything that's uh, been done by the state and all the other people here in the community that have supported them. And do me a favor, um, Carl, just walk us through those few moments before when you're sitting in the courtroom. What was the tension like in there as you were awaiting the reading of the verdict? Well, it was actually everyone was uh, gathered outside the courtroom first. They had the doors locked still for about 10 minutes after we'd heard that there was a verdict. It went through the courtroom house really fast. And so we were waiting outside the locked doors. They have a double set of doors. Um, Mm -hmm. And then a hallway before you go to another set of double doors to go into the courtroom. And so the furthest outside one was locked. And so we we're just there all talking. And um, as, as I've been saying, uh, you know, two to three hour windows, what I expect for this. They were very hungry. So they were going to eat and mm -hmm. talk over the case. And they were going to go home by five o'clock. And 
I, I, I've heard Tim say the same thing. So, I mean, you just get a feel for jurors and what I'd seen during the deliberate, uh, excuse me, during the closing arguments confirmed the fact that this was on a normal trajectory, that defense didn't have a case. Rashbaum was up there spinning his wheels, talking nonsense the whole two hours and 40 some minutes. And they were just going to go back there, talk about it in, in enough detail, and then come back out with a verdict and go home for supper. Hey, Carl, I thought this verdict and the case they presented would lead them to have the confidence to go against Donna. Right. Because Donna's hip deep in this as much as Charlie. Yes, I, I really think in the coming weeks they're going to do more arrests of Adelson's, at least one. I, I was uh, hoping they'd, they'd do all of these a long time ago, right? That's what I've been – that's what I was saying would be the smart move. But, you know, I give him credit for going after the first one. They wanted to go after the biggest fish. He's got all this money behind him. He's got these – high price lawyers out of Miami and New York City to try to come down here in uh, Tallahassee and thinking they could, you know, pull one over on the jury and get at least one holdout and just wear them down with hung juries and let uh, Charlie eventually go free. But this jury was smart. They were very attentive. And one of the things I was looking for is when um, when Rashman was arguing his, his uh, closing there, even though it's so painstakingly boring, they still try to keep their attention. They're fidgeting. They're they were one of one of the ladies was looking at her fingernails, and that's how I talked about how jurors sort of send send a message to the attorney if they're boring. It's like you know what, seriously, wrap it up. And you know I, another one was looking up in, uh, at the ceiling and stuff like that. So they do all these forms of messages that you know Tim Tim and I and t t folks that do trial work. You, you get a message, but Rashbaum, you know, he had nothing really to just fire on because. His entire theory was an absolute farce, and he had nothing to work with. And that's that's that was Charlie's choice. Charlie gave him nothing to work with. It's not it's not the attorney's fault, right? And Charlie didn't want to plead guilty. He didn't want to roll over on his family, so he made this decision. And I don't know if you saw it. His head dropped straight flat on the table. The maestro thought this the money always bought him out of his every jam he got into out of life, right? And this money could not buy this jury. This jury got it. They saw what a horrible, despicable plan this was, how much hatred there was for Dan, and that Dan had them, and he, and that we also had Wendy was also involved in this as well. And think about also, they, they, I give them credit also how they argued on the, um, the state argued in their closing argument that the, um, you know, Jeff Lacoste was framed. I thought it was a, that was a brilliant word to use because that's exactly what so many of us have been saying that, these Jeff Lacoste got set up like a bowling pin and so did Katie and Katie had malicious intentions. It was a mutual use type of relationship more with, with, um, with, uh, Charlie, but you know, Jeff Lacoste, he was, he was looking for, for a wife and, you know, some stepkids to, uh, to take, take on and, and, and live happily ever after. But he was, he was obviously set up that, uh, like, like a frame job that the court, um, that the court, uh, jurors heard. And also keep in mind that uh, Georgia had a great comeback when she mentioned that uh, they, you know, I think it was like Jeff Lacoste got his heart hurt, but thankfully he didn't lose a brain. And that and that, and that was unfortunate for the defense. And so you I know, thought that I was think, a great point. I thought Jeff Lacoste was one of the most credible witnesses in the trial. He even said he was a pathetic figure who was in love with this girl and didn't realize he was a dupe until he just happened to take that trip early. Um, right. I think that was a mistake attacking her. And during his closing, I don't know if you caught this, Carl, but he said, I'm almost done. He knew the jurors were bored to death. And he told them, I'm almost done. Never yeah. a good thing. Yeah. Richard. Yeah. Um, Tim, I'd like for you to address the question from Ski Hat, Sarah. It's, it's probably okay. putting the card ahead of the horse, and then we'll get back to Richard. But can Dan's family sue? She's meaning Charlie now and the Charlie. Adelson family. Yes. Oh, she's absolutely. Really, she can. They, and, oh, absolutely. Do you they think can. that's something that they might pursue some sort of wrongful death suit now that he's been convicted? Uh, I'm sure they'll, they will find a lawyer that will take that case. Um, yeah, I think so. I don't know uh, about the statute of limitations. I don't do civil, but I don't know what the statute of limitations would be on that. On a wrong generally, generally, they're around four years for most states. I don't know if there's an exception, um, you know, based on a verdict or something like that, if it extends it out or something like Maybe. that. But I don't know. But yeah, I mean, definitely, if you got a higher standard of proof, which is uh, in a 
the uh, criminal law setting versus civil, that's definitely uh, something to go after. Carl, most importantly, did you have a chance to talk, uh, probably not, to Ruth right afterwards? But uh, Oh, yes, sure. I did. Yeah, oh, right did after you? she got done with the media. Because actually, um, I talked to her also today. I met her today. I actually met Phil last night. And he was, you know, very, very down, very thinking like, you know, I want to get my hopes up, but I don't have, you know, I, I don't have much confidence and I just got to, you know, be guarded. And uh, so I told him and I also saw him today and I said, look, have faith. This is an overwhelming case. The jury's going to do the right thing. I'd not seen the jury, obviously. I just came down here last night. So I never got a chance to size up the jury. So I'm listening to the, you know, what um, John is saying or you're, you you guys are saying or uh, Katie Kool-Aid is saying. So and, and I saw it for myself that, you know, these this juror um, pool is uh, very, very, um, very attentive. And when I saw them grinding it out with uh, Rashbaum's closing, I, I thought, you know what? I, I don't think mentally they can even stand to listen to what he's saying because it's, it's just all this circular gibberish that, but, but they kept on their professionalism and tried their best to do this. But even Rashbaum, I, I submit to you, Rashbaum, it looked like he knew he was lost in this thing as well. In fact, if you notice during uh, much of today, Rashbaum actually had his shoulder turned like to block yeah. Charlie. I don't know if you guys saw that on TV, yeah. but most yeah. of the day he was like not wanting to have any contact and he pulled his ch chair away from the table even. Yeah. The, by and the way, so, there's, um, there's video going around the Twitter sphere of an interaction between Charlie taken straight out of the pool footage, a live pool camera of Daniel Rashbaum. Charlie was trying to talk to him and I guess the jurors walked in at that point and he's, Daniel Rashbaum said something to the effect of enough already, stop it to Charlie. Yeah, and he was, I saw that. You saw that. What I do you think it. of that, Carl? Yeah, I mean that's that's uh, that's some of the conflicts you have as an as a defense attorney on a murder one case, and your clients, you know, trying to dictate the outcome. And but the fact of the matter is, he had nothing to work with. He's defending this ridiculous th story that Charlie came up with. He he had how many years to work it up, and so you can't coach a client to lie. You can't coach a, a client to come up with a theory that works best. These uh, jurors. Uh, jury selection folks that came out of New York City, they can't create a fictitious story and then say, tell tell them this is what we think you need to argue. That's totally unethical. They're attorneys. They're bound by the, the ethical standards for their state bars. So this is really Charlie's show. This is what he this is what he ordered. He ordered this defense to happen just like he ordered the murder. And both were botched, terrible plans that blew up in his face. Uh, Richard, so I'm, uh, you know, was at one point a professional observer, still consider myself as such as a journalist. And I noticed in closings that Georgia used the phrase y'all because she's from Tallahassee, something that Daniel Rashbaum could not do. And he stuck out like a sore thumb, almost as much as Charlie Adelson, if not more. Uh, the comments just in our own chat uh, is that he's obnoxious. He's screaming. No, he's a New Yorker, a Miamian, if you will, in a Tallahassee courtroom. Was that a fatal flaw by the Adelson family, Charlie Adelson in particular, to not bring in someone like a Tim Jansen, who's a local defense counsel, who would have resonated much better with the jurors? Well, I don't think it's a fatal flaw, but I do think, look, everybody likes to be to know their people in their hometown. They want to feel like you know who they are so that you can relate to the jury. You can have a New York attorney, but you've got to be able to relate to that jury somehow. Mm -hmm. And if you come in there with a different tone, a different speed, a different a different affect, it reads you're an out of town or you're not one of us. And that can create distance and obviously make it harder for a jury to relate to you, relate to Charlie and relate to the evidence in the case. So it does make a difference. Uh, the good question from NJ Coolchick, my home state. I don't know. Uh, Carl, have you heard anything about a press conference uh, from Georgia's people? No, but I know that Jack Campbell and probably about four or five others were like a couple benches back behind me, John and I and uh, on the same side as well. And uh, so they were there to see the verdict as well. They they were staying late as it took to uh, see, see if a verdict was reached today. So um, and then they filed out of the courtroom, like with everybody else soon after. And so I, I expect them to have some kind of news conference or maybe they'll wait till tomorrow. But there's a lot of news crew, a local news crew right outside of the uh, 
of the courtroom when uh, when I came out of there and they were interviewing Ruth and, and uh, Phil as well as Shelly. Yeah. And there, uh, by the way, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I'm, I've known Ruth for some time, but I met Phil and Shelly uh, when I was there last week. Two of the nicest people you ever meet. Really, really nice. I mean, just sweet, kind people. And I'm not just saying that to say it. And uh, I feel really good for them. Um, can I add one? Go ahead, Carl. Can I add one thing, though? I will say this. When when I was trying to encourage Phil last night, he was he was smiling. And I was telling him, don't worry. This looks good. I haven't seen the jury make up. I'm hearing good things. We're getting good reports. Trust the process. It's going to work good. And then today, after the arguments, after everybody left and the jury's deliberating, the Markells were actually smiling. I saw Ruth smiling. I've never seen her smile before anywhere. She was smiling. Phil was smiling. It was such a great thing to see. Shelly was smiling. And so to come down to Tallahassee, when, when, when's the last time they had much to smile about in Tallahassee? So um, this is a first step, a, a huge major accomplishment, this verdict for the state. And uh, I think it's going to give them a shot in arm and momentum that they're going to go forward. And we're going to see more arrests here in the coming weeks. And for those who are just tuning in, and this is our biggest live audience to date with STS, and we can't do it without you. So huge thanks to uh, STS Nation. Tim Jansen, famed criminal defense attorney out of Tallahassee. He's top right corner. Bottom right is Richard Gabriel, a very well-renowned jury consultant out of the Los Angeles area. He's handled some small cases like OJ. I think you worked OJ and uh, Phil Spector and others. And then you've got Carl Steinbeck, who's a former military JAG and a private criminal defense attorney. And it was great to see you in there, Carl. When did you decide? I didn't know you were going to be there. When did you decide you were going to come in for the uh, reading of this verdict and closing arguments? Well, I've, I've been trying to clear my uh, availability to be able to come down here. And so I was able to jet away out of uh, where I was at in Tennessee yesterday afternoon. And so I got here last night and that's where I was able to meet John and Phil. They're out in the uh, central courtyard at their hotel. And so we had, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half of a discussion there. So um, it, it was very, very great to see this kind of verdict. And uh, like I say, the real, the real feeling here is just happiness, elation, but people aren't shouting or you know, d demonstrating all this uh, exuberant joy. They're really more relieved that justice happened, the right thing happened. And Charlie is the one that really had most of the, uh, you know, defeatist uh, motion across him where he just, he could barely lift himself off the table. Even when he did lift his face off the table, he was a slunk down his uh, chin against his chest. And, uh, you know, and, and, and no one in here is like, you know, you know, celebrating his defeat or anything like that. Everything, everybody here is very professional. They just want justice. This is not revenge. This is justice. And uh, so I thought it was very, very impressive. There's people that came from all over here as well. There's folks that, you know, fl flew in from um, numerous places across the United States, people that drove up from Miami as well that are still here, that have been here a number of days. People also that are commenters on, on this uh, Survivor show have come up here that have been following the case as well. So Anyway, it's been a it's been a great group of folks here to encourage Markels. The Markels feel feel everyone's love, and I think that's a really great thing as well for uh, for the folks here in the United States. Yeah, they finally have some justice, and uh, not only the United States, but people are watching this daily from I can tell you the Republic of Ireland, Scotland, the UK, Australia, big uh, following there, South Africa, literally around the globe. And why do you think that is, Richard Gabriel? Why do you think this is? gotten the attention of so many uh, around the world. There's going to be another Dateline episode, another 2020 episode. Why this case? Why this kind of interest? It's it's just, I think, for a lot of people around the world, our jury system is so unique. I mean, there's very few countries around the world that even have juries or, or they're extremely limited. So people are always fascinated. And there's just obviously an inherent drama because Sometimes it's just a magistrate judge, and sometimes the court proceedings are, there's no, uh, oftentimes there's no television coverage at all of cases around the world. So they're, they're fascinated by the sort of concept of citizen justice, because most trials, criminal trials around the world are, are uh, obviously decided by judges. So people are, are fascinated with the fact that ordinary citizens are going to be listening to a case like this over a protracted period of time and then are going to be rendering a verdict. And it's inherently dramatic. It's televised. 
Um, and so it it captures the attention uh, of of a lot of people. When we were doing the O.J. Simpson case and the Casey Anthony case, you know, we, we used to get calls from around the world, just people fascinated with just how does this system work? And so it is something that is a, a sort of never ending a curiosity to a lot of countries. And Richard, Rick, I, I wanted to ask you a question, Richard. It's been bothering me. I know jury consultants are great and I've used them and they help you do focus groups. You can do mock trials and they do help you pick juries. But would you ever, you yourself pick the jury, go up there and ask the questions of the jury? Now, I know you're not a lawyer, but don't you think you, that the lawyer loses that chance to build a rapport with those jurors when they have somebody else? And then that whole team leaves the courtroom. Yeah, it's... Uh, I, it is something that I know the jury consultant for the defense did. It's, you know, I've, I've worked with so many consultants over 38 period of time that I've done, 38 years that I've done this. I've never known of a, of, there's only a couple of jury consultants I know that actually question jurors. And it's usually because sometimes they're asked to, they, they sometimes have a greater knowledge and can ask really probing questions when the trial team cannot. But overall, especially when you're dealing with a local venue like this, you do want the local attorney or the least attorney that's going to try the case. It is such an opportunity. It's a first impression for you to talk to this jury because when you're talking to them directly, you get a much better feel for who they are. You listen to what they're saying. You hopefully reshape your case according to the people that you have there. And you do, as you said, Tim, build a rapport with them in those opening things. It's a critical first impression, and I think it is a missed opportunity if you have someone else do it. Right. And for those who are new to uh, SGS, uh, welcome. Uh, this is the best true crime community in all the land. I always say best guest. That is our tagline, the best guest in true crime. Best guest, better community. I can guarantee you, you will not get better analysis from better guests anywhere, and you will not find cooler people in the chat who are here for the right reason. Uh, to seek out justice. And we partnered with people like Carl Steinbeck of uh, Jury Trial Mentor on YouTube, uh, who's fantastic, and check out his YouTube channel. Uh, we are all working uh, together to bring you guys some of the best coverage that there is. And this is our first foray into a you know full-fledged coverage of a trial, which is something we're going to continue to do with other high profile trials and other trials uh, that are of immense importance, even if they are not as high profile as this one. Uh, we've got a super sticker here from Rash tried his best with this a-hole of a client, just as finally for Dan and his family. Um, yes, he did. Carl Steinbeck, one thing I don't know if you saw from your vantage point inside the gallery is when the jurors walked in for the last time to deliver the verdict, Charlie Adelson did not stand up it was his final act of defiance. What do you make of that? Yeah, and he also wasn't wearing his tie. And none of the jurors looked at him except for one, the uh, lady in the corner closest to the uh, spectator box. And so that that's another sign. But everybody expected this. You could just really feel the energy that this was an overwhelming case of evidence no one no one was fooled by this and and many times i thought of tim jansen if they'd have been smart they would have gotten tim jansen in here but at the same time tim jansen can't flip this evidence and make sense of it right no. so but just just they just thought they're better than everybody they thought they're better than anybody in tallahassee the best lawyers in tallahassee can't compete you know with who they're going to bring in and so but in the end the right thing happened and i think it speaks so well of this community carl and I, by the way Go ahead, Tim. What? And then I got to go. Carl, I think the bailiffs took the tie from him. They okay. Did it on purpose, so they can't hang themselves in the cell. They would have taken up when a jury. Oh, jury yeah, so rather than putting it back on, yeah, that makes sense. Right. Right. So the the uh, sheriff's department are gonna uh, kick me out of this room now. So <laughs> we'll join we'll join back at the hotel room. And Katie is uh, looks like she's joining as well. So yeah, she was uh, right standing re real close to us. So. Signing yeah, off for now, but I'll join back in another 15 or 20. Thank, thanks a lot, Carl. Have a safe trip back to the hotel. Katie Cool Lady. How you feeling, Katie Cool Lady? Happy birthday, Katie Cool Lady. What a birthday, right? I'm yeah. just leaving the courthouse. We're all getting kicked out. Uh, day. Oh, my gosh. How I'm feeling is everything, you know, relieved. I could just burst into tears, which I will do when I get home. And uh, 
unsurprised. And once again, Carl Steinbeck called everything 100% from the jump, said that we were going to get a guilty verdict today. We did. Amazing. So this is, a, this is obviously a great birthday present. Tell me, prior to the reading of the verdict, just tell us what the scene was like in the courtroom. What was the feeling, the mood, all of that? Well, we were in a nearby restaurant, and um, we just, I mean, Fancy Fiction and I and a tr local trial watcher who's, like, super connected in this community, we just hoofed it back. I mean, we got in by the hair of our chinny chin chin, got in there. And, you know, I mean, they're really tight in that courtroom, so... But, you know, the mood was he's going to be convicted. You know, I mean, everybody was pretty obvious, except for, well, Charlie looked pretty bad. You know, he looked pretty bad all day. And, you know, I, you probably saw dropped his head down when they were guilty. Like, are you really surprised? I'm sitting there thinking, I wonder what Donna's thinking right now. Coming for you next, maybe, you know. Yeah. And Katie, did you have a chance to talk to Ruth, Phil or Shelly? And what you say to them, if so? Yes all the above and um you know, they're very very relieved um but it's a complicated thing having been through it you know and i mean they're in good spirits very relieved what i, what I said to them was just hugs and um but it's over and things like that i'm working with ruth on this project she gave me a bunch of books um signed book of her books so i'm going to be working with that tonight project i'm working on and um you know, my heart goes out to them because, you know, there's a letdown after it's over, a lot yeah. of it, and, you know, and there's a depression that follows. That's normal. So um, but, you know, I let them know I'm here for the duration and that I'm going to be here for every proceeding. And I think there's going to be more. And yeah, that, was my, that was my next question. Do you think they go after Donna and how soon, Katie? And then I'll let you go on and enjoy your birthday. I don't know how soon, but I mean, I think there's a momentum right now and I think they're teed up. You know, they've got everything. They don't have to spend a lot more money. You know, they've got everything kind of teed up. They, you know, it's not that much of a different case. So I'm surprised if we see an arrest here very soon. Katie, send my love to Tallahassee. I love being up there. Miss you. Uh, miss everyone. Say hello and I'll uh, check back in. Hopefully we'll get you on a regular uh, full on panel tomorrow to discuss this further. All right. Yeah, I'll be around here a couple more days. All right. Happy birthday. Thank happy you. Happy birthday, Katie. Preston Scott, he hosts the uh, morning show in Tallahassee. Preston, what's the official name of the morning show there in Tallahassee? Uh, cleverly named, The Morning Show with Preston Scott. We dug deep for that one. <laughs> so, Preston, I was up in Tallahassee for the very first time. Aside from the torturous drive from Miami up there, it was amazing. Uh, your reaction to this guilty verdict tonight? No surprise at all. Um, you know, th this was, to me... Uh, I mentioned previously when I visited with you, and I've certainly talked about it on the radio program, you know, I sat on a grand jury for capital cases for six months in Leon County many, many years ago, and there was more circumstantial evidence in this case than any case that we heard as a grand jury. And uh, I thought that while the cross-examination of Charlie Adelson might not have been uh, Georgia Kappelman's best moments. She summed it up well towards the tail end of it. And today, her closing argument, I thought was brilliant. I thought she went through it chronologically. I think she uh, anticipated everything that was going to come from the defense. And I, I was just feverishly writing down notes because the, the, the wealth of evidence that she presented and uh, your previous guests, I think, really nailed it down in that uh, Georgia did a pretty good job nailing down a case for against Donna Adelson today, I feel. Um, and so I'm not at all surprised by the verdict. I'm grateful to the jury because I can only imagine, you know, this type of case, the toll it takes. Um, but they did the right thing. Yeah, Preston, it's interesting you say that. Tim and I, Tim has been giving us amazing analysis. He's been doing that for the Tallahassee Democrat throughout the duration of the trial as well. But at one point I said to Tim, we were texting back and forth during the actual closing argument. And I said, is Georgia going a little too heavy on Donna? She's not trying her. Tim said, not at all. Is it your opinion that we'll see an arrest in the coming weeks? I can only hope Tim and, and you know, may be able to speak to this far better than I, 
I, there's part of me that, you know, and I've had Carl Steinbeck on a program with me for the last uh, seven days. I wonder if they are, if they have Don and Harvey under surveillance. I mean, Tim, would that be something that they would do? You know, they, they could do that. Uh, the feds would be doing that, not the TPD. They okay. could have them. Um, and they could have them on a, a fly list, no fly list. Or if they try to fly, they could say, okay, we're going to arrest them. I don't know that, but um, I think there's a lot of momentum. And I think a lot of evidence that came out today that I'll do during this trial, that's very implicating on Donna, for sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know about Harvey, um, but I, I would think Jack was there. It's a big moment. Uh, it's a big win for Georgia. This murder was was a big case in Tallahassee. And I think they did an excellent job. You know, Preston, from day one, my own mother, who is a licensed therapist, believes that Harvey Adelson is much more involved. Is it your understanding or your belief, I should say, that Harvey and Wendy are also complicit in this? Or do you just think that Donna, in essence, masterminded this and was the, you know, the puppet string puller here? What do you think? I, you know, I'm kind of leaning with where Tim is on this. I think Harvey, I, I don't think it's plausible that Harvey didn't know. I just, not as close as that family has been, has been documented to be. Um, and, and keep in mind, I think Georgia has an ace and the ace on the whole family dynamic is the other brother. I think Robert um, could be used as a very powerful witness because of Donna's involvement in the in the breakup of a previous relationship that ended up being a marriage for Robert. But, but to get back to your question, I think in my opinion, there's, there's a strong case for Donna. I think there's a growing case against Wendy because the inconsistencies in her testimony now are really shining. Oh yeah. Danny and I were on fine terms. No, they weren't. Mom didn't know anything. Yes, she did. And then the level of vitriol that Donna has, I would submit that Donna was the, the fuel to the fire in all of this. And that Charlie just kind of played Charlie. He's what? Maestro, right? He bragged about that. Yes. I think Charlie was the guy who said, Mom, I'll take care of it. But Mom, to me, in listening to the evidence, in listen, reading those emails and those texts, and the, and, and the fact of the matter is, Dan Markell was winning constantly against Wendy and the Adelson family. And I think he was set up to prevail in that motion against Donna. And, and, and so I feel like if you want to call her the mastermind, I think she was the mastermind and the fuel. Charlie was more the arranger of it all. The maestro. The maestro. Interesting. Very interesting take. Richard Gabriel to you. How important is it now in a, in a post-mortem to interview these jurors to find out what they were thinking, what they were saying? And uh, we are now joined. This is uh, an all-star, all-star panel. Monica Jordan is here, private investigator in the Hidden Away back. I know she's at home. She's tucked or in her office, tucked away in her corner. But Richard, first to you, the importance now of these interviews with the jurors uh, will the state conduct them and see what they were thinking? Who conducts these interviews and what is the purpose? Well, um, the state probably will not conduct interviews. As a matter of fact, I don't think the state actually even wants, to, wants any interviews done on this particular case. The defense may try to attempt to interview these jurors because they may try to find out if there's some misconduct on their part that they use, can use for a purpose of appeal. If the jurors use some outside resource, they did some independent research on this, to try and that inform their verdict if they met outside the presence of the jury. You know, obviously they're looking for anything they can use for an appeal. So I think the defense might try to contact the jurors to try and interview them. Um, but everybody's always interested to know what the jurors thought during a trial. I mean, it's a long trial, it's a huge trial. Everybody's fascinated and everybody goes, what was it that appealed to you? Sometimes it's things you think so obvious Sometimes you think you, they, they pick up on stuff that you have no idea about. So it's always interesting when we do post-trial interviews in cases, I'm always fascinated to find out what jurors pick up on, what the attorneys think are the most important things in the case and what the jurors go, nah, it wasn't so key for me. Here's the element 
that I really focused on in the case. So everybody's interested in it, but I think the defense is most interested in this. In Florida, they're prohibited from contacting the jurors. Huh? Okay. The, jur the jurors can contact them, okay. but the defense and the prosecution cannot initiate the contact. But I'm sure <laughs> in a verdict this quickly, you're going to have jurors probably contact the uh, prosecution. You, you probably will. The other issue that the defense may do is they may also track the social media of the jurors after it to see if there's any indication of jurors posting things about the verdict or about the deliberation process that they can possibly use for a, a post-verdict appeal on that too. So that's another element that sometimes has become more prevalent these days. Uh, by the way, there's a comment from M. Maricacci, new here as a true crime enthusiast. How have I never stumbled upon this channel? Great work. We're relatively new, but we're not here as Conor McGregor, the UFC fighter, says. We're not here to take part. We're here to take over. Monica knows that. We're going to be doing more and more trials. Get to know the name STS. We are here to stay. So is Monica Jordan, Tim Jansen, Preston Scott, Richard Gabriel, some of the best experts uh, in the field. Monica, as you slink into your little black hole in your office, you should be the one person whose face we can see bright and shiny, but you're hidden away there. Um, your reaction? Uh, it was a quick verdict. It was definitely a quick verdict, which has never been great for the defense. Um, I'm, I am interested to see what the jury say, the, the jurors say, but I will tell you, it's, it's always been my experience that within the first couple of days, you'll get people that will reach out to the defense and to the government. And um, that you get such a wealth of information because you learn what did it. And if they're willing to come to you and talk about it, then that's just great. In death penalty cases, you have to have uh, leave from the court, approval from the court to reach out to jurors. And, and only then you have to have um, a real reason to be able to in, to interview jurors like you have to have a knowledge of uh jury misconduct or something you just can't go knocking on jurors doors in florida hmm. monica do you think that donna adelson is next and someone in the chat asked about the possibility of prosecuting both wendy wendy and donna simultaneously that's something that carl carl steinbeck and Granted, he's not from Florida. He's not from Tallahassee. And he also was a military uh, prosecutor for a lot of years. He said he would have tried the entire Adelson family at one time. But realistically, <laughs> Tim's laughing, but realistically, uh, could they try Wendy and Donna potentially together? Is that a possibility? Well, anything's a possibility, but they have to get them indicted first and they have to go, I mean, go to a grand jury. And I still don't, you know, I just don't know if it's enough. I mean, it would be great. If, the, if that's what happens, but it's like I said the other night, you only have one chance to indict them and try them. If you don't win, you don't get a bite at the apple again. So why risk, why risk kind of like half stepping it and, and rushing? And I say rushing loosely because, um, you know, this has been going on. This, the Markel family has been dealing with this since 2014. So, you know, that does make it very difficult. Preston Scott, I know you're not an attorney or radio host, but what are the prospects you think now of Charlie potentially cutting a deal? And then we'll have Tim weigh in on this. Do you think uh, Monica's already shaking her head? No, but um, what do you, what do you think? You know, now he's facing life in prison without parole. Does he turn on one of his family members to cut some sort of deal? That's a great question. I, I it, at this stage, um, nothing would surprise me, but I would lean against no, he probably wouldn't. But, um, but again, at some point he's going to be sitting with the reality. My God, I'm, I'm probably going to do life in prison. And my sister who I did all this for is just sitting out there. I mean, it, it to me, it's going to have to be a moment of a kind of self-reflection and, coming to grips with the fact of exactly his role in this and getting the truth out for everybody. But I don't personally see that happening. Tim Jansen, Diane, right here. What if Charlie turns on his mother and Wendy? What do you think the chances of that are? Zero. Um, the tapes they played that convicted Charlie, several of them exonerate Wendy, right? 
Remember the one tape where they were saying, Wendy doesn't realize how lucky she is. She really doesn't understand how lucky she is. That's them talking about what they did for her, how she didn't get involved, how they kept Wendy out of it. I think she, they're going to have a hard time prosecuting Wendy, plus the fact they've given her immunity, which means they're going to have to have derivative. They can't use derivative use. Castigar is a big burden to get over to prosecute someone when you force them to testify. Donna didn't get those benefits. The state didn't call Donna because maybe they didn't want to give her that immunity. But I still don't think they have enough to get Wendy. And I think some of those tapes that were introduced, if I was representing her, I would use those as defense. That they may have done it for her, but they can't prove she participated or knew. Harvey may have, may have been told about it, but it doesn't show him taking any action other than having dinner at that Mossori restaurant. That's all we know about Harvey, right? Yes. That that's what we know. And I assume that you know the state might have brought in other evidence if they had it. Monica, you helped prepare Luis Rivera, uh, probably the smartest of the gang who took a he copped a deal yeah. and is gonna get out of prison at some point. What do you think he'd be saying right now? You think he's happy to see Charlie Adelson convicted? He was trying to throw your client under the bus. He's probably looking yeah. for him in prison. No, that's not that's not how Lewis is. He he's he doesn't find any solace in any in anybody going to prison. I mean, he he's not happy that they tried to lay this at his feet, and he kind of made that very clear to Mr. Roshbaum. But um, the person he's happy that got convicted is Katie. Yeah, that is the only one that Lewis really cares about getting convicted because he doesn't know Wendy. He calls her the lady. He calls Charlie the dentist, but Katie was he, Katie was the one that drug Sigfrido into this, and and by proxy, Lewis, you know, Lewis went along for the ride, and uh, yeah, he, I, I just, I just don't think Lewis finds any any solace or any excitement in, in the demise of somebody else because prison sucks for for whoever you are. And Monica, is he a target in your opinion now that once he heads over to state prison and he makes his new home there, are the Latin King gang members, the type of people who are going to find him words going to spread that he claimed that they extorted him, made up this story and are now going to, you know, punish him for that. And oh, you're talking life. about Charlie I'm talking about Charlie now. Oh, Charlie is definitely a target. You don't, um, you don't even put those words. You don't even put the Latin King's words in your mouth. Like he, he's going to, he's going to have to be in protective custody or some kind of closed management. Or uh, it, like I said, the other night, probably interstate compacted. I just don't see him having a real, not like anybody goes to prison successfully. I mean, it's a really tough, it's a really tough thing to do, but right now this is, this case has gotten a lot of media attention and um he, he, he said some ugly things and I, you know, I don't, I don't think a lot of people are going to appreciate that. Stacey. I don't think he's, I don't think he's going to be fighting just that problem. I think if you just look at the reality of his last name, his heritage, um, he's going to face a challenge with white Aryans that are inside the prison system. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's sure. sure. absolutely right. He, he has a, an entire host of problems that he's facing and, uh, interstate compact may be in his best interest that they may be spending money on appellate council. They may be spending money on interstate compact. You know, he's, he's processing a lot tonight. He is processing a lot tonight. He, he honestly maybe thought that he was going home. And, uh, and I'll, although I don't have any real, uh, great feelings towards Char Charlie Adelson because of his involvement in this and what he's done. You know, it's, it's one thing to come from privilege and be a dentist and have everything in the world. That's a very different life than Luis Rivera and Sigfrido Garcia. And, um, you know, that's just not lost on me. I mean, he, he tried to play with the big dogs and get involved in something and plan a murder and kill his brother-in-law. And now he's going to prison. Yeah. Uh, Richard, to that point, and by the way, Stacy, glad we could be with you for uh, on your drive from Kentucky, it looks like, to Detroit. Um, but Richard, to you, um, where was I going here? I just lost my notes. 
this is in her rebuttal. Georgia said to Charlie Adelson, and she was speaking to the jurors, that, you know, after Rashbaum said it couldn't be him, why would he take his perfect life, which was what Monica was ju just talking about, and ruin his perfect life? She said it wasn't an issue of ruining a perfect life. It was an issue of arrogance, thinking that he could not be touched. The jurors, the jurors obviously saw this. The jurors read through that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, in, in a jury trial, character is king. Even though prosecution technically doesn't have to prove motive, motive is always on the table in a criminal trial. Jurors always want to know why. Who is this person? What would have made them do that? And I think the portrayal that they were doing, even, even for the most part, uh, bringing up Wendy so much in this, it's creating a whole portrait of who Charlie was. They were trying to figure out, really, what is this man? And, you know, they did kind of convey that there's a type of arrogance, a type of above it all, I can get away with this type of thing that I think they were communicating during the trial. And when you are a defendant in a case like this, I know because I've worked with enough of them, you know, it's critical what your body language is in the, in the trial, what it is how you come across, and even talking to your attorney about what how you are portrayed in that. I mean, you have to have a certain amount of humility when you're when you're a criminal defendant. You can't come in there with the assumption I'm completely innocent. I've got this perfect life. Why would I do something like that? That's not what jurors are looking at. They're look they they if you're accused of a crime like this, jurors want to see a humility in yourself. They want to see a type of humbleness. Oh, I can't believe I'm here. This is terrible. I may have made some mistakes in my life. There, we always try to look at, on the criminal defense side, what can you tell uh, a jury about mistakes that you've made? You can't come across as this perfect, as having a perfect life. As jurors always look through that. And so that's why I think there is somewhat of a mistake in portraying this sort of above it all attitude. Yeah, and it definitely hurt today. Dave007, saying Georgia said y'all in her closing arguments and that helped her win is just dumb. Uh, you are smooth, but not as smooth as James Bond 007. That's not what I was saying at all. I was saying that there is a familiarity with someone like a Tim Jansen in a Tallahassee courtroom, whereas to me, Daniel Rashbaum and Charlie Adelson stick out more like sore thumbs. It had nothing to do with that specific phrase specifically helping in that specific moment. So just to clarify <laughs> that, uh, Monica George, <laughs> Monica, and by the way, to Preston's point, it's exactly, I mean, one of the many reasons I fear prison more than anything in life is I don't think I would do very, very well with the uh, Aryan nation in prison myself. Monica, no. someone's asking right here, is Charlie going to be in prison with Luis and, and uh, Sigfredo? Luis is in a federal prison for now, but would they ever send him to the same state prison as Sigfredo? No, they'll... They'll be uh, they'll be on separation status. I mean, some some mistakes are made within the system. I mean, can you imagine trying to uh, manage the logistics of all of that? But um, I, I don't think that they will they'll cross paths. I mean, every once in a while, I'll have uh, two co defendants because technically they're co defendants, mm -hmm. um, and I've had a crossover in the classification uh, reception center or medical or something like that. But for for a situation like this, this is a pretty high profile case and they're going to try and keep them separated. But as soon as I say that, I just remember I have two kids that uh, are in the same prison now that were sentenced in 04 for a, t a terrible murder. And, um, and they're, you know, in the same, pr in, in the same prison right now. So it can happen. But I, th I think Charlie would be holding up the flag saying, Hey, I'm not supposed to, I'm not supposed to be around him. Preston, our uh, own Steve Cohen told me, and I have not verified this, that deliberations for Sigfredo Garcia, the sh convicted shooter in this case, took longer than the deliberations for Charlie wow. Adelson. Does that surprise you, Preston? And what what has stood out to you the most about the last couple of weeks during this trial? For me, just the anticipation of finally getting to, you know, I, I felt like, you know, obviously Luis offered a plea. Uh, Sigfredo went to trial, Katie went to trial, had the first hung jury. Um, that was the low hanging fruit to me. Uh, I believed from the very beginning and 
I'll just skip the the scuttlebutt that you hear around town. Tim, I know, hears that stuff around town. Um, there were immediate suspicions of family involvement because of the dynamics of the relationship between uh, Dan, Wendy, and the family, the Adelson family. But I would say just anticipation that we finally got a chance to hear more evidence than what you heard in the podcast over my dead body. You got to hear uh, what Charlie was going to say in his own defense. Um, he was the only shot he had at defending himself. I, I would just be curious to ask the legal experts, the, the three of you, this question. I was put off personally as just someone watching um, by Charlie's childish behavior when an ex-girlfriend was there on the stand and the smirking and the smiling. And I was also put off by his attorney's reaction today when Georgia was going through her closing argument. I felt that the the half smiles and the little smirks and the I just thought it was off putting. And I'm just curious what your reaction was. Before they give you a reaction, I'll give you my reaction. I'm a New Jersey kid from right outside Manhattan. And to me, that's the smugness and arrogance of, you know, the New York Miami connection. But, Tim, I'll defer to you. You know, you, you, you no matter what the other lawyer is saying, you're not supposed to make faces. He didn't blend. Would we say he's my cousin Vinny coming in here from Miami? Cousin Vinny was a little better. At least he wore an outfit that was closer <laughs> to the people here. Uh, Dan didn't blend. He never blended the whole time. Um, the defendant never blended. He was smug. He was arrogant. He thought he was smarter than everybody in the courtroom. Um, he had disdain for his lawyers. And it was interesting during the closing um, that Dan turned away from him. Like, I don't want to be associated with you. He turned his chair, his own lawyer turned his chair away from him. Um, Daniel needs to work on that. You can't have those kind of, I'm surprised the judge and the bailiffs didn't come to sidebar and say, hey, listen, stop making faces. Stop doing that. It's not professional. You're a member of the bar. Um, and I don't know if this is his first big case. Maybe he didn't realize the camera was right on him. Maybe he's just thinking the judge or the bailiff won't say anything. But the camera was right on him, and it, it wasn't a positive view he was given. Hmm. Uh, Richard, this comment is interesting. DJ Ross, Alec Murdoch, of course, convicted of killing his wife and son, which is beyond horrific, was able to turn to his family as he was led away. Charlie Adelson had no support. I'm wondering how much did, did jurors notice that, that there was no one in the gallery behind him throughout the duration of this trial? I heard that there was a friend of his there today, but no one up till now. Well, it doesn't overcome all the evidence in the case, but jurors are looking for these kinds of things to, again, try to make an assessment of who this defendant is. I mean, they're, they're given these sort of little pieces of evidence. They're given lots of character stuff. They may have to make assumptions on that. And sometimes having support in the courtroom, whether it's friends, whether it's family, whether it's you know people that are there to support you, makes a difference. And so I think it does make a slight difference because jurors are trying to figure out who you are and how you're supported. If you're all by yourself, it does kind of communicate that you're a loner uh, and you're not part of necessarily the community. Monica. This is a difficult situation all around. I said this off the top. You know, it's a huge win for the Markells, but at the end of the day, a father is gone. Now an uncle is gone for all intents and purposes. These two boys are going to know what happened. It's possible the grandmother goes away. Charlie's headed off to jail and then state prison. If you had a consult, if he was your client, what would you say to Charlie tonight? We're not going to lay down. We got to, we, this is not one we lay down. We're going to appeal. Maybe the judge made some bad rulings. I mean, you, I, this guy is in chaos emotionally. Like he just, he thought he was, he thought maybe he was going home. So I'm going to probably rah rah him. If I just went through a two week trial with a guy and I've been on his team for a couple of years, I'm not, I'm going to be at the jail tonight. He's going to be on suicide watch tonight. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm not going to, I don't, 
when the jury comes back in a, in a devastating case, in a devastating result, because believe me, if you're doing defense work, you're losing a lot more than you're winning. I mean, these cases are tough. And if the case, if you had half a chance of really winning, the government would offer you a reasonable plea. But typically they don't because they know they're going to kick your teeth in. So um, in, in this situation, I would probably go to the jail tonight. And I would uh, probably have a contact visit and just be like, listen, this this is what happens next. Because you can't really talk about what happens next while you're in the middle of the game, because then that signals the client that you think you're going to lose. So now, you know, now now that he's lost, now we're like, well, let's talk about what's going on next. I mean, the last thing in the world a defense team wants is the client to hang themselves tonight. Right. Um, regardless of how we all feel personally about this terrible, terrible act that they all did and all of their involvement, I don't think any of us as just human beings, you know, want to see want to see that. Uh, that would be a horrific outcome. Uh, none of us wish that on Charlie Adelson, but yeah, he's, I mean, I don't, I mean, you know, he, he's, he's where I he would, belongs, but yeah, for sure. I mean, for sure. I think, you know, I think uh, a life sentence is appropriate. He masterminded a murder mm -hmm. and um, you know, that's, that's how the sentencing structure is in Florida. But to, um, I, I don't even think Ruth Markell who has lost a child would would wish that even on our worst enemy, Donna Adelson. I just don't see that in Ruth. I just, they're just, they're not classless people like that. No, and, I, I know, I know Ruth. I don't think she would wish yeah. that, but, but Monica, just taking this a step further. I mean, this is a guy who was driving Ferraris, who was sleeping with strippers. I mean, he was a dentist making millions, I think between 2000 and, 14 and 2018 he was making over three and a half million dollars a year how in the world do you adjust to life in a state prison in florida i mean how do you do that well he's gonna have to do a lot of soul searching and you know i mean his hubris and and his ego is what got him here who like like he's the first guy in the world to think his uh brother-in-law's an asshole like like this is like some new thing like come on <laughs> I mean, if that was the case, we'd be killing everybody. And so you know, it was his, <laughs> not, not my brother-in-law, uh, but like, but you see what I'm saying? Like, you know, that's just, who does that? That, that was pure ego. That was pure hubris. And and what I found the most offensive in the trial was he was big Johnny talker. Oh, I'm, let the Latin Kings come after me. I'll kick their ass. I'll show them. And then he gets on the stand and he's talking about how scared he is. I just want to say one thing. I mean, I know the trial's over, but typically in my experience, and I've probably done more extortion cases than most or been a part of, you know, the defense of extortion cases. You don't kill the person first and then go, hey, you better pay me. I already killed him. You tell them if you don't pay me, I'm going to kill them. So uh, they kind of got that backwards. And I think it looked a little disingenuous as a defense. Preston, to that point, what did you make when you heard during opening statements, you heard the argument or the theory that the defense was laying out? It was personally hard for me to follow. Even closings were hard for me to follow from Daniel Rashbaum. But he had a tough job. But what did you make of this double extortion theory? Did you just think it was ludicrous from the get go? I don't mean to insult the legal people that are here with me because I'm a radio show host. Like, Please, do, I, but I will anyway, but I will anyway. Go ahead. I laughed out loud. I really did. I, that was so remarkably preposterous. I thought to myself, Charlie, what you're paying for better than this. You have to be. Yeah. And now in defense of the defense, what do you say? I mean, if your client is is trying to say that he's not guilty of and, and all of this, trying to explain all of these intersections away, I don't know what you're supposed to say. I mean, to me, you know, we talk about sometimes someone throwing a Hail Mary at a, in a court case, right? Just going for something. This was this wasn't a Hail Mary. This was that play that you do at the end of a football game where you lateral and you lateral and you lateral and it ends up in an offensive lineman's hands and he's trying to figure out what to do with it. That's what this looked like to me. And that's what made all of this so tragic is that, you know, 
so many lives are involved. And I don't want to lose sight of the fact that there are two little boys that right now, Uncle Charlie has been convicted of murdering their dad. And I, I'm just curious, is there no charge that Wendy can face, even if it's perjury, even if it's proving that the testimony she gave, just ask her again, because I know she had immunity, but let's go through those questions again and let's, let's ask her and then let's roll out all of Donna's emails and let's roll out the text messages and let's just see what we get. I mean, there's got to be something. And with regard to you only get one shot at it, I'm kind of where Tim is at the very beginning and where Richard is. There's a lot of momentum. And I think you either indict now or you drop it. It's done. Tim, what about that? What about lesser charges? Other people have asked that. If you can't get Wendy on first degree murder, do you get her on something else? And if so, well, what? Well, she's given immunity, but that immunity use immunity does not cover perjury. So if they wanted to charge it with perjury, which is a very hard thing to charge, I can't remember the last time in 30 years I've seen it done. But if there was, it may be. And then there's a limitation. Would a judge give her a maximum, make her a convicted felon? I, I think, you know, I don't know. that. I don't know. Yeah. Preston, I, I will say that Tim Howard got 14 years in federal prison today. Um, you remember Tim Howard, right? I, you got to remind me. He was the lawyer that defrauded all these people of money for CT, the concussion scans, the NFL players oh, yeah. took all their money, millions of dollars, and he was a big political guy. He got 14 years, and he's in federal prison today. By the way, it comes full circle. Preston Scott's own father called the first couple of Super Bowls that uh, famous <laughs> uh, football uh, commentator, announcer, Pia O'Brien, stop feeling for Charlie and Adelson for Charlie and the Adelsons feel for Dan. He was killed by them for no reason. Robbed Markell's and sons from Dan's life. Adels Adelsons are evil. Agree with you a thousand percent, 100,000 percent. The focus should be on the Markell's. It's been on the Markell's. Right. Perhaps I bring up Charlie Adelson because uh, I never want to see myself go to prison. Maybe it's a. But, uh, you know, Dan Dan Rossbaum thought he was going to win. He thought he was going to win this trial. He thought well, he was going to be the Baez lawyer the next. Ba ba he thought he was going to win. Did he explicitly tell you that, Tim? Or yes. That yes. And and what was his reason? I don't want to say why, but he felt like he had a good chance of winning the trial. Uh, Richard, to you in Georgia's rebuttal closing. She said, Charlie is smart. Charlie, Charlie Adelson's a very smart guy. He's a successful periodontist. He had a long time to plan this. And she says, you can ex uh, assess Charlie Adelson's credibility in the deliberations room. My question to you is, throughout this, throughout his testimony, he was so rehearsed. He knew dates from nine years ago. He knew page, num he knew page numbers of transcripts, actual page numbers. Did the jurors pick up on that? Did they know that it was rehearsed, that he had been practicing this? Yes. I mean, it's, you know, when Murdoch took the stand, you know, there's the same kind of difficulty with really, really smart defendants who insist on it. And I know because I've dealt enough defendants in my time who wanted to take the stand and they want to prove how smart they are. They want to prove how clever and how, how you know, how with it they are. But the problem is that jurors, when you when you do that, they can see also, you're smart, you can plan this thing, you've had a whole thing. So you have to always think about that. You know, there's a very specific kind of conduct that jurors expect when a criminal defendant takes the stand. They expect, as I said, humility, they expect contrition, they expect, you know, I'm, they expect, you know, sort of uh, an expression of, oh my God, I'm so feel so sorry for Dan. You know, I had my differences. There's a lot of concessions that have to be made knowing what the allegations are against you. And if you don't kind of perform each of these little acts, and this is something we explore when we do focus groups and mock trials, what do the jurors expect from a criminal defendant if they're going to testify in a case like that? It is literally any tiny slip up that you make can be your death knell uh, on the witness stand. You just have to be so critically important and you cannot just be 
hey, I've got everything planned I've, to the T. If you're too smooth, you know, jurors are looking for a type of authenticity in a witness. They're looking for somebody who really is imperfect, who because they think, look, you wouldn't be here if your life was so perfect here. So if they come across as everything's great and I wouldn't possibly couldn't possibly be involved in something like that, jurors will hold that against you. So it's a it's it's a tough position for any criminal defendant to take the witness stand uh, because there's little room for any particular error. Uh, Tim Jansen, this question has come up. Uh, I'm sorry, Preston, do you have a comment? I was just going to ask Tim a question because it it, uh, it it goes back to the comments about we should be worrying about the Markells and the Sons. Tim, do you happen to know the law for those that are outside of Florida? They may not know about the law that was passed relative Marcy to it was it, it, well directly related to the Markell case. Uh, Ruth Markell petitioned on it, and it's about visitation and so forth. The fact that Charlie, a family member, has been convicted now, does that give any more teeth to the Adel, uh, to the Markell family to get those boys, if not if not, you know, permanently, but at least shared custody? You know, that's a great that's a great question, Preston. I don't know. I know Wendy said she thought that that law was unconstitutional, even though she didn't. <laughs> She didn't even know what contempt meant. So I don't know what the talk at law school she went to. Uh, and she went there on full scholarship. So um, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, okay. But there's no question. I think, uh, that's yeah. a good question. You know, I think the custody issue is going to become something major now in the following days and weeks. That's something I'm going to follow up with Ruth about. But in light of a conviction now and a possible indictment with Donna, by the way, one of the tougher things to listen to, speaking of honoring the Markells, was how easily, Monica, how easily, when you're listening to these wiretaps, Donna went from talking to Charlie about plotting this to then being a grandmother. You could hear the boys on the side. You know, she'd be in deep conversation with Charlie and then say, oh, wait a minute, honey, wait a second. Don't get on the elevator yet. It was such a weird juxtaposition, Monica. But do you, do you think that there will be some sort of intervention, at least on the Donna Adelson and Harvey Adelson side of things in terms of their ability to spend time with their grandchildren, or is that just pending an indictment? I think that's going to be pending an indictment. I don't do any family law. I, I, I mean, family law is a whole different animal, but I will tell you that really kind of shows her character. Here she is. Don't get on the elevator. Everything's ro rainbows and unicorns. In the meantime, her and her son, are planning to off the father of these two children. You know, the one thing that, you know, we talk about the Adelsons and, and the Markells and, and all of these peripheral issues, but these children are of age to read now. How, how do we keep them from reading and watching in this, in this land of the internet and the, you know, information superhighway? How do we protect these children? I mean, Wendy can say all day long she's trying to protect her chil these children from reading all this stuff. Their uncle is going to prison for life. Thanksgiving is not going to be the same. Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever holidays they uh, they celebrate, there's going to be questions. And I just, I wonder, these children's father was shot in the head twice. Like, I don't, I think we, I think we just lose sight of, of how horrible that is. And then, you know, and then we're going to go to grandma and grandpa's house. What are you crazy? Like, By the way, there's, there's another very innocent victim and that's Charlie's son, five-year-old, a five-year-old. Uh, Charlie has a son. He just lost his father and he doesn't deserve that. You know, this is, it's horrific all the way around and I'm going to get hate mail. Why are you feeling for the Adelsons? I'm not feeling for the Adelsons. I'm, I Happy feel for the children. Yes. I feel for the children because I know what it's like to see children in a federal or state prison visiting park having to see their parents. It's awful. It is the worst thing in the world. And no human being that has any grace or mercy would ever want a child to have to go there. But sometimes that's the only way they can have a relationship with their parent. Well said, Monica. Tim, one question that's been coming up over and over is just kind of minor, but if you can fill us in on why the judge read out loud the jurors' names one at a time. 
Well, he was polling the jury, which is a normal thing once a verdict is read when either side wants it. But he should have read juror numbers instead of names. Yeah. I don't know why. He, I, I, I've never seen that done before. It's usually juror number eight. They call them by their juror number, not their name. And I think it was a mistake. And I hope that he um, gets that off the record and it can't be ordered so they can find out who these people were. Well, the media, people like, you know, the court TVs of the world are already, you know, they've heard the names are going to be pursuing them. Richard Gabriel, was that a big problem? Yeah, it is a big problem because jurors, you know, you know, these cases, jurors, I mean, it's less of a problem in it with a guilty verdict. You know, when we did, we we're working on the Casey Anthony case and we came back to the non, non guilty, you know, jurors got death threats and stuff. And so yeah. jurors, all jurors, whether it's a guilt or an innocence verdict, they are honestly trying to do their best. And here they're committing a public service and they do not deserve public vilification. And so, you know, they should be entitled to their anonymity. Now, sometimes media outlets find out who they are anyway, and they can do that. But my hope is that the media is very respectful of these jurors and doesn't pursue them and respects what, if whatever they want for privacy. They want to come forward and talk about the verdict. That's their prerogative. But uh, we really need to be mindful that that we have to be respectful of jurors themselves. So I was a little surprised that he did read, read out the names. Tim Jansen, we brought this up earlier in the trial and it sort of faded away, but I'm just curious. There were moments because this was, I said this on Court TV, by the way, I'm going to be doing Court TV live at 8 p.m. Eastern time. I believe Vinnie Politan's on a much needed vacation, but I will be there nonetheless. So please join in, join me in about an hour and, 17 or 18 minutes but we were talking at one point tim jansen about the issue of suborning perjury he was trying to i said this on court tv rashbaum was trying to basically shove a a square into a square peg into a round circle with this defense theory but was he teetering on a legal edge there is there any issue of suborning perjury in your opinion and how would that process be followed through on you know, a lawyer as an officer of the court cannot participate or allow a witness to testify falsely with perjured testimony. So a lawyer sometimes is put in a position that's very awkward, that can actually sometimes make you withdraw from a case. And, and so if you know what someone's going to say is false, you cannot in any way assist or help that person do it meaning you can't prepare questions and do this and, and make it like it's a true statement. Um, I don't know what Daniel knew. I don't know where he got this defense. I don't know if his, law, his defendant told him, this is my defense. He made it up before he met Dan. I don't know if he talked to three lawyers and each one said, well, I can't put you on the stand. And he got smart enough now to make sure he said this. Um, but it's it can be a problem. The way to fix it, you tell the judge, Your Honor, my client wants to testify. I want to test have him testify in the narrative. So what that means is everybody's on notice. J Mr. Adelson, tell us what happened. Mr. Adelson, anything else you want to tell? Okay, anything else? And that way you're not helping that person suborn perjury by asking questions to assist him in doing it. I don't know if that happened in this case. Mr. Rashbaum, will, I'm sure he doesn't want to lose his law, bar license on this case for any client. Um, so I can't say that, but it can be a problem. Um, if the bar finds out, it, it is a very serious thing. Um, judges have the ability to, to refer cases to the Florida bar. And when a judge refers it, they take it with very serious consideration. We're going to be doing a lot of follow-up shows on this in the coming days, hopefully with some jurors, uh, hopefully with Daniel Rashbaum and others. Uh, Adam Lamparello here. Part of me feels bad for Charlie. I think that Donna was the mastermind of this tra tragedy and her controlling and narcissistic behavior influenced him. Uh, I think that is partly true. Monica, I don't know if you were here yet, so I'm just going to go back to you on this because you came on late, but we were talking about the possibility of Charlie copping some sort of plea deal by maybe flipping on one of the family members, whether it's Donna or his mother or Wendy, his sister. 
your thoughts on that, and then we'll begin to wrap up. Appreciate the uh, great panel. By the way, please follow me on Twitter at Podcast STS, at Podcast STS for all the Showtime updates, and uh, on Instagram at Surviving Survivor. Uh, Monica, what about a possible plea deal for Charlie Adelson? So he's he's been convicted by a jury. They, it, it, I have never had this happen. Um, where you get an offer after you've been convicted by a jury. Now I have been, I I have been in a situation where the jury was out, and the government came to us and said, "Hey, listen, the, the, you know, what do you think about will your guy take forty? Will your guy take twenty? You know, all of that stuff." But the jury came back. Why would Georgia offer him anything? Did not. Georgia, Georgia doesn't have to do anything now, but try and figure out a way to indict the other two. If they wanted to offer him something to turn on his mother and his sister. I, I just don't see him doing that because I think it would kill his father. Um, if, if his mother, if him and his mother are so tight that they feel like they've got to help out the idiot sister and by killing her husband, <laughs> then you know, I, I just don't see that. And even if he did, even if he fell on his sword right now and said, Oh my gosh, it was me and my mom, Wendy and my dad didn't know. You would have to do a leave of court to to even to set that verdict aside. And I don't even think then you could. Mm -mm. Like, I just don't know. You know, I've done 30 years, about 27 and a half years of post-conviction work. And I don't even know how you would go about setting that aside. I mean, we've put a man on the moon, so I'm sure it can be done. Um, but I, I think that's a heavy lift. And I think he missed his opportunity, his window of opportunity to do something in his own benefit and he rolled the dice and he he chose poorly you know he he should have made better choices my philosophy is i may love i may love my parents and and my husband with all my heart i don't love them enough to go do life in prison for him i would have told on them a long time ago i'll let grady know that he knows <laughs> <laughs> that would be uh monica's husband Preston, you think there was a collective sigh of relief in Tallahassee tonight? You think Tallahasseans want to see Donna indicted? Do they want to see other Adelsons brought to justice? I think absolutely they do. I think they want to see this come to an end. You know, I, I'm already getting information as I'm sitting here listening to just this wonderful insight that I'm benefiting from. And I thank all of you for your expertise. I think Tim knows me well enough to know that I, I don't, I don't break stories to break stories. I'm not that person. I don't believe in, in putting serial killers' names out there. I wish the media would be more responsible. If I had the offer to talk to jurors, I probably wouldn't. Um, I would allow them the anonymity unless they're seeking it and want to talk for some reason. But the bottom line to me is I, I think that there's more to come. I absolutely do. Whether that leads to Wendy, I don't know. I don't believe it's plausible that she did not have awareness of this, but what kind of charge comes of it, I'm not sure. But there's no doubt, in my opinion, in this community, uh, look, Dan Markell was an FSU law professor, and this, this community revolves around two things, government and the universities. And Dan Markell is an important figure in that regard. No one knew who Dan Markell really was except his friends until this happened. And, uh, and there's a real sense of, okay, you got the easy ones, but there was real clearly family involvement in this. And I think this is the first step. And so we'll see. Uh, you see this comment here. Georgia spoke to the media. Do we know what she said? We don't because we've been doing the podcast, but I do believe she spoke to court TV. She has spoken to us and, uh, Steve Cohen will work together as a guest for a full length show and uh, we'll bring Tim Jansen and Monica and Preston back and we will uh, interview her and get her take on how this case went. And if she's willing to uh, let us know what her plans for the future are a couple of real quick things, Katie right. McManawa, Monica, that was another one. Someone in the uh, few people in this chat wanted to know if she would be cut any sort of deal because of her testimony in this case, it sounds a little bit like what you were just talking about. It's after the fact, she's already convicted. Uh, could Katie McBanawa get some sort of relief from her sentence? 
unless she files an ineffective assistance of counsel claim or a newly discovered evidence, that's the only relief she's going to get in post conviction on a 3850 appeal. Um, I don't know the legal vehicle to undo a conviction. I mean, she's, she's been convicted. She, she too missed her window. You know, Georgia, Georgia offered her immunity prior to her trial. And, and, and Katie basically, you know, went like that to Georgia. Well, let me tell you, Georgia kicked her ass, got her convicted. It took her two times to do it. Listen, you don't want to play poker with Georgia Kappelman. I'm just telling you, she is (laughs) my friend. She is my friend. She has kicked our ass all over the courtroom and other high profile cases. And I'm just here to tell you what, there's no, no benefit. That is why I continue to say David and Chuck Collins had a really great strategy, although it was giving me an absolute heart attack for demanding speedy. They got him in there. I was able to convince Lewis that this was in his best interest. He would actually be able to come home one day. And and that worked out great for Lewis. And the fact that he's, he was telling the truth. You know, Joel, when you get a good deal from Georgia, that's a victory. Yeah. Oh, well, they were seeking death in this case. A life sentence would have been a victory when they're seeking, you know, if you do death penalty work, a life sentence is considered a victory. And yeah. and the fact that we got a term of years for the non-shooter who was just the ride-along guy, um, that term of years was uh, a little bit of a legal miracle. The people that do death penalty work will tell you 20 years on a case where you are seeking, where, where the government was seeking to put a needle in your client's arm is a win. Yeah. And and Lewis deserved that because it, Lewis it, was the least culpable. He was not the shooter. And he told the truth that allowed the government to go after all of these other people. It's sort of ironic think, because well, he's he's the least educated. He's illiterate. And he's, in a way, the smartest because he copped that. You deal. don't have to be a Mensa candidate to tell the truth. No. Nope. Right. Katie's, Katie's not going to get a deal. She's testified twice. She's got so much baggage as a witness. Georgia said she's not getting a deal. She told her no promises have been made. The only chance she's got is that her lawyers turn down full immunity twice, which means the ineffective counsel is really high just for that purposes. And so what could happen, they file the ineffective. I, I was going to take immunity, but my lawyers said I could win. They said I had no chance of losing. And then the state says, okay, we'll stipulate to the ineffective. We'll let you plead to 20 years and and, and the case is over. That's the only chance she's got of getting a deal. So she'll have already done 12 years before you get to that point. Um, and she get, she's got life. I, I know, but if she got relief on a 3850 appeal for newly discovered evidence, she will have already she would have already have spent a, a, a decade there before she'll ever potentially see relief. I mean, two quick things and then we'll uh, get some final thoughts. Papa bear always joins us from Moscow, Idaho, obviously now the infamous home of the uh, quadruple murder there at the university of Idaho. And we're going to be covering that trial. And Tim and I have already talked about it, planning to go out there for that trial. And who knows, maybe Richard Gabriel, uh, will join us uh, out in Idaho if you can make the time. To you, Richard, we talked about this briefly off the top. You know, these were people with a, a lot of wealth, successful, a periodontist. He brought in this guy, Josh Dubin, high power jury consultant. It didn't work out for him. Uh, far from it. it, had no impact. What, what kind of lesson do we take from that? Well, you know, look, the evidence is the evidence in a case, and we can talk about all the strategies in the world, but if the evidence is, is going to be tough on you, then, then you know, there, there's nothing much you can do about that. That being said, there's a few things that, that, you know, when you're picking a jury for the defense in a high profile case, and especially when you have tough things, you are looking for particular types of jurors. You're not looking for an acquittal. You're really looking for a juror or just a couple jurors who are going to hang that jury, mm-hmm. or, or cause so so you are looking for personality types that are not going to necessarily mesh. You're going to look for a lone wolf. You're going to look for somebody who's a little bit of an outlier, who's who may be independent or or may polarize the jury. Really strong-willed people. So there's 
there's a different dynamic that you're looking for, especially when you've got a really tough evidence case on the defense side. I don't know what their jury profile was from the defense side, but clearly the, you know, the prosecution was able to pick a jury that obviously got along really well, that came to a decision very quickly on this. So, and that, that didn't, so I think that's when you are looking at it, you have to kind of look at what are, there's so many elements when you're looking at a difficult high profile case like this, there's the, you know, the, the affect and the demeanor and what, how you structure the story and the evidence, um, how you create that reasonable doubt, who are the people that are going to really nitpick and sort of dig into the evidence to try and create that reasonable doubt. Um, but ultimately the evidence is what the evidence is. And you have to kind of deal with that in the story as it is. And sometimes the, it doesn't roll your way as we saw in this particular case. Well put. Twyla Olson, Donna was definitely the mastermind evil followed by this comment, which I'm going to have Preston react to, and then we'll uh, wind it down. Adam Lamparello, uh, you're the non-attorney here like me, Preston. Do any of you think a life sentence is excessive here, given that Donna is a likely mastermind? And do you think sentences generally are too lengthy, Preston, for many crimes? I'll put it to you. The, the lay well, that's too broad of a question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually involved with the prison system and correction system in Florida with a group called the Florida Foundation for Correctional Excellence. And we're trying to help inmates find a, a useful life when they've served their time and paid their debt to society. And so I think that in that situation, um, let's, let's take it in the two pieces in which the question was asked. One, certainly there are some sentences that I think are probably inappropriate for the crimes committed. There's no doubt about that. I think there are inequities in certain types of crimes, depending on the race of whoever is being charged. But I think in closing um, with Charlie, no, I don't think life in prison is too, too firm a sentence at all. It doesn't, Donna's, Donna's yet to be indicted. We'll see. I think she will be. But Charlie uh, is going to be sentenced how he should be sentenced, in my opinion. And uh, Carl Steinbeck, right as we're about to wrap back here, Carl. <laughs> Hi, Carl. <laughs> Perfect timing, Hello. actually. We wanted you back here. Uh, Carl, I'll throw this to you. I had this, you know, my mother's rubbing off on me because I looked at Daniel Rashbaum and had a moment of panic for him. You know, he basically, uh, his defense throws the Latin King gang members under the bus and he just got a guy that was a uh, murder for hire convicted. Oh, Johnny, I lost the sound. Well, I'll come back. Johnny, to you, I lost Carl. Sound. Hold on. I'll come back to you. Tim Jansen, Monica Jordan. Let me go to you on this. Actually, does Daniel Rashbaum have any reason to be worried tonight? Is defendant that was a murder for hire now convicted felon is in going to be going to prison because of his defense? And he also threw the Latin King gangs under the bus. Uh, he's obviously doing his job. But does he need to be worried more than that for taking this case? I don't think so. I mean, we. We do cases like this all the time. I mean, <laughs> we take cases that are not the most popular in town. Preston <laughs> can tell you that. I've had, <laughs> I've had some of the most hated clients, and I've had Jameis Winston, some of the most famous loved clients. Um, sometimes you don't pick your clients, and sometimes they're not hated until you've already got them. Like I, I was representing Brian Winchester on a uh, kidnapping charge and little did I know find out later he was the, the murderer in a, in a case that was solved like 19 years unsolved so and I had the FAMU bombing case Preston probably remembers in 2000 that almost shut down FAMU and it was a very polarizing they almost Jesse Jackson came here um, I got the trial changed the venue changed to Pensacola but yeah I was concerned um, sometimes you are concerned about some of the clients, um, but you know, we, we, it's the process and you're trying to make sure they get a fair trial. If they're convicted. They're convicted. Monica, you, does Luis understand that Luis Rivera understand that a guy like Tim Jansen or Daniel Rashbaum are doing their job and just doing a job? Yeah, I mean, Lewis is Lewis gets it. I mean, Lewis absolutely gets it. You know, most clients get it. I mean, unless 
unless you're just a lay down lawyer that doesn't do anything. I mean, listen, I've, I've never had one jump up and go, oh, thank God I got convicted. You guys did such a great job. All the way up until the jury comes back, they're telling you you're awesome. You're doing a great job. You know, thank you so much. And then the verdict comes back and you are persona non grata. Fortunately for me, I continue a relationship that somewhat insulates the lawyer so that I can kind of explain the next step. Um, but I mean, no, they're not, they're not happy when they're convicted. I haven't had one yet, you know, be all excited about volunteering. Somebody made a statement a minute ago about, you know, I, I made a comment about Luis just being the ride along guy. Uh, there it is. Um, you're right. He, he, Lewis did know exactly why he was coming. He was not the mastermind and he did not plan this. And, and he, um, and, and he was not the shooter, but pretty lucky Tara is absolutely right. His involvement got him 20 years in prison. And so um, he is being punished and he has atoned for his involvement by coming forward and telling the truth and assisting the government in convicting all of these other much larger players than he was. So I apologize to Miss Pretty Lucky Tara that I was so cheeky about him just kind of, you know, not being involved. Lewis was very much involved. Welcome to the club, Monica. You're getting yelled at too. Carl Steinbeck, what is Daniel Rashbaum doing tonight? Uh, Monica talked about if she was defending him or working with him as a client, she's not an attorney. She'd probably be at the jail tonight. What do you think, talking him off the ledge, what do you think Daniel Rashbaum is doing this evening, Carl? Yeah, I agree with Monica. You're trying to console your client, trying to give him a shot in the arm of uh, encouragement that there's a pellet avenues they can pursue and they can do post-trial motions as well that he could file perhaps. But after that, he's going to have to file, uh, hire his own attorney. And, uh, you know, I wonder if he's going to hire somebody in a big city again and go that route. But he's probably looking at spending maybe three quarters to a million dollars to hire some defense team to try to attack this verdict. But so it's, it's only, um, it's only going to be continued misery for him. And uh, he's going to be facing in, any, in a variety of threats from anything from Aryan nations to potentially Latin Kings. I don't know how much Latin Kings will find out about it initially, but he's just a very, he's like a uh, purple unicorn uh, in a sea of other fish and he's going to stick out like a sore thumb. And so that's, what's going to make him an easy target. I don't think he can handle protective custody. Even there, you're not totally safe. And so he, he's in a, he's in a, he's boxed into a corner. And I think for the first time, he's going to start having thoughts of what he, what, he, what did he do to get, down this road where he's listening to what his mom wants to have done to eliminate the um, the father of the two boys here, Ben and Lincoln. So it, it's his whole life has tur ton turned totally upside down because I think he owned the room. He owned the jury. Money, money always solves problems for him. And for the first time in his life, money can't solve his problem. And I, I think he's it's going to start to sink and also when his appeal is pending that takes a long time and you know i think there's could be some issues of his life being endangered in the next year as well so it's 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 a, a whole new a whole new kind of way of life for him now that is going to be in, in many ways very horrific not a, a life that i would envy at all and he's going to be using that money to get himself some protection if that's even possible uh let's begin to wrap this up Richard Gabriel, one of the uh, nation's most renowned jury consultants, at the end of her rebuttal statement, Georgia Kaplan said, only one of us is putting on a magic show. It's up to you, the, the jurors, to decide. They obviously decided in favor of the state being the real story. Richard Gabriel, your final thoughts on how the uh, jury came to such a quick verdict? And uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's 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 really interesting when you're doing closing arguments. Jurors are very, um, they're skeptical about being sold on anything. And so that's why prosecutors tend to kind of like to say, this is up to you. It's really smart, especially in closing argument, to give power over to the jury at that point. I think Rashbaum got up there and he was really selling his case. And he was saying, here's what you should believe. And jurors get really resistant when you tell them what they should believe as opposed to just laying out the pieces of evidence that they get to use to come to their own decision about that. So I think, you know, it's it's smart on the prosecutor's part 
to be as straight and as serious as possible and to give that power over to the jury. It ultimately is their decision. And I think that's obviously what was successful in this case. Preston Scott, you see it here from you and me discussions, 138,000 and they were still broke. Uh, this layaway extortion plan as though they were putting it on a visa it didn't fly. Your final thoughts on this defense in this case? Uh, I, again, I think the defense was just borderline ludicrous. I think it was almost insulting um, to, to jump on the back of something Richard just said to broaden it just a little bit. People hate to be sold, but they love to buy. And I think that that someone who is good at what they do create an environment where people can buy into, whether it's an argument or a sales pitch, it's the same thing. They, they empower the people that they're pitching to. And I think that Georgia did a brilliant job. She did not mention Katie Bag Madama and her testimony uh, very much in her closing. Um, it was almost irrelevant the way she, she laid everything out. And so I, I think that the defense, I think the defense had a really bad case. And I, I, I just sit here wondering um, what someone like Tim or someone like Monica or Carl, we'll discuss it tomorrow, I'm sure. Did the defense really do anything to try to dissuade Charlie from going this route of trying to proclaim his innocence with this much evidence? I mean, I don't have the answer, obviously. I'm just a talk show host. But there's just no there, there's just no way I can put my mind around why they went the way they did with an extortion plot with all of the texts and the intersections with everybody involved. It was just foolish. But thank you all for allowing me the privilege of sharing time with you. Preston, it's an absolute thank honor you, to have Preston. you on the show. And I know you got to jump because you're up early. So uh, I will uh, I will allow you to leave, Preston. How about that? And uh, we'll get you hey, back. Hey, thanks on. very much. 4 a.m. is coming quick. Yes. Take care, Preston. Rest. Thank you, Preston. Uh, Monica, you're, you're next here. Um, serious question from Flyover Girl. Why, oh, why did Wendy get immunity? If you can answer that for us, Monica, and your final thoughts on how this all played out. She she got immunity only because she was under subpoena. I mean, this is more of a lawyer question. Um, it, it wasn't like she got a, a pass. It was you're, okay. as long as you tell the truth and you're under a subpoena, it can't be used against you. So um, it's not immunity like we think as a lay person, like, oh, she's just allowed to get up here and say whatever, and they can't be charged. Had she misspoken one little bit different than other testimony she's given in the past, I think Georgia would have probably, you know, done something with that and was probably laying a trap hoping she would. Carl Steinbeck, Rosemary Romero, why didn't any of the Adelsons say no to this plot for murder? One did. Rob Adelson is now estranged from the family. He's a doctor up in Albany, New York, does not speak to the family. Carl, your final thoughts on this monumental day where Charlie Adelson was convicted of first degree murder of his ex-brother-in-law, Dan Markell. Well, I think it comes down to hate and hubris. They thought they're above the law. They have connections to political elements in the legal community down there in Miami that stretch all the way to Tallahassee. So they thought they were untouchable. And if they want to exterminate somebody that's a part of their family, they're not going to think twice about it if they hate that person enough. So the bottom line is the long arm of the law caught up with them. Their hubis caught up with them. And justice has finally rendered a verdict against one of the Adelsons today. And there's going to be more arrests that are coming. And uh, I think that another teaching point here is what this is what happens when you don't have robust, honest, frank discussions, potentially between Rashbaum and his counsel. Uh, it seems to be a recurring theme among big high profile case, cases that attorneys aren't willing to take their client to the rubber room and really hash it out and tell them, do you realize how much you're ruining your life? But it seems like they, they tend to believe that uh, the best of course of action is to go with what their client wants and uh, and no matter how ridiculous that this is, and that's the thing that was a recurring theme in this trial, closing arguments is the defense story is so ridiculous. It's insulting everyone's intelligence. And so why didn't the defense have the ability to convey their client that message? That's, that's a big question mark in this case, but it happens quite a bit. It happens very much in, in the criminal cases that 
that you see that are that are on TV and get in the national media. So it's a dead loser of a case. He had no chance of a, of a win. It was a fair jury. They deliberated very seriously. They were as attentive as they could, despite this being a ridiculous, insulting type of defense theory that had uh, no chance, as I say. So it's it's really you just scratch your heads. It's all there's so much things about this case that are so puzzling. Why wouldn't Katie flip earlier? Why hasn't Sigfredo flipped earlier? And so you could just go on and on down this road of, uh, and why couldn't the attorneys get Katie to flip earlier? So there's so many different moving agendas going on in this case that it's part of the thing that makes it so appealing to the public. But the other thing is that this long delay of justice is, is now starting to turn the corner. And I do believe we're going to see future arrests of at least two more Andelsons in the, in the coming weeks. We will see if that plays out. Of course, we saved the best for last. Tim Jansen, listener, by the way, giving us a super sticker there. And then a question here from Eileen. How much did the fact that Rashbaum is not a criminal defense attorney, he's really a white collar attorney, hurt his ability to know how to handle the case? I don't want to beat up on Daniel Rashbaum. I think, again, his back was up against the wall. But your answer to this, Tim, and your final thoughts. Well, a white collar defense is criminal defense. Um this was a murder case, a violent murder case. Um, there are different kind of lawyers that do white collar stuff and there's others that do the violent crime, sexual batteries, robberies, that you get in there and you fight, you know, you get in there and get dirty. That's a lot different than the white collar guy that's reviewing documents and intent is uh, usually you got a high paid client, you got all kinds of resources to you. Normally in these violent crimes, you don't have any of that. Well, I might have Monica, my investigator. So he may have been ill-equipped. A lot of the lawyers in these cases showed no client control. Um, no client control was on Katie Meg Bonawa. She should have taken the, 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 the full immunity twice. Sigfredo, I don't know why Sigfredo. They may not have offered him a deal because they felt he was a trigger man. They don't normally give the trigger man a deal. Um, Lewis got a good deal. He took a deal and he might be the reason why we've solved the case to the point we're at. Um, Monica has been with me in cases where we've had to have frank conversations with clients and sure, I would rather go to trial, make more money and can win a case. But if we lose, I go home, right? And I've gotten paid, but you can't always put yourself above your client's best interests. And sometimes your clients are their own worst enemies. Mm -hmm. They're just waiting for you to tell them that you can win it and they want to believe it. And then when you lose, it doesn't go well. Cindy Church, hello from Canada. SDS is the absolute best. The inside info is so interesting and so appreciated. You will not get a better panel of best guests. That's why it is our tagline. And it's not just a tagline. It is reality. But I always say best guests, better community, the best community in all of true crime probably in all of uh, YouTube and the rest of the social media world. What a dream team. Thank you to all. You've got Monica Jordan in the bottom corner, Richard Gabriel, top right corner, a renowned jury consultant, Carl Steinbeck, of course, a former uh, military officer, a prosecutor in the military, a criminal defense attorney. He also fought for our nation. And then you have Tim Jansen, the famed Tallahassee defense attorney, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Eight o'clock. Don't forget to watch Joel Waldman on court TV. That would be me. So please do that. And uh, thank you to one and all. We will be back tomorrow with a full length program at either 5 p.m. or 7 p.m. Eastern. Follow me on podcast on Twitter at podcast STS for the exact time. We will continue to follow this case throughout the week and uh, we'll get Carl, Tim and Monica and maybe Richard back on until then. Love you. America, love you, the Republic of Ireland, Australia, Tasmania, Bangladesh, we had people all around the world tuning in here, Cape Town, South Africa, of course, Israel, and I don't usually do this tonight, but love you, Ruth, Phil, and Shelly Markell, and of course, Dan Markell. Mm -hmm.